Hey everyone, welcome back to What Happened with Jackie Flores. I'm Jackie and I hope you guys are doing super, super well. So welcome to episode 40 of my podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube, then you can tell that we are in a different background today. I'm currently filming this at my house, so that's why things look a little bit different. Today's case is just absolutely frightening. I truly don't think that there is another word to describe this case. It's just frightening, disturbing, and just absolutely heartbreaking. Now, when you go camping, I want you to think about what your biggest fear is. For me, my biggest fear is animals. You know, a bear coming to get you in the middle of the night, insects biting you, snakes. That is one of the main reasons why I don't go camping because I'm just really scared of animals and I'm honestly kind of scared of nature. Something that never crossed my mind is that animals aren't the only thing that you need to fear while camping. Strangers are just as dangerous. It is scary to think about how vulnerable you are while camping, especially if you're camping in a tent because anybody can just come up to you in the middle of the night open up the tent or you know cut it open and do something terrible that is exactly what happened in today's case we're going to be talking about what happened to 16 year old liana friedenbach and 19 year old felipe cafe there is just so much information to go over so let's jump right in and let's talk about what happened most of the information for this case was in portuguese so i did my best to translate everything and to pronounce things as accurately as possible however if I do pronounce things incorrectly, I apologize, but I'm doing my best. So Liana Friedenbach was born on May 6, 1987 in Sao Paulo, Brazil to her parents Ari and Marcia. She had a younger brother who was born in 1991 and their family was Jewish and very active in that community. Her father Ari was a lawyer and he was very good at his job, so he was a great provider for the family and they were considered to be upper middle class. They lived in this like really nice neighborhood, they had a beautiful home home and the family was just extremely close. They honestly seemed like a typical loving family. Liana and her father had such a beautiful relationship. I swear just watching the interviews with him breaks your heart and it makes you so emotional because he just absolutely loved his daughter so much. Looking at videos of when Liana was a baby hugging and kissing her father, it just, it warms your heart and it makes you so emotional because that kind of father-daughter relationship is so beautiful and I feel like it's kind of rare. Ari says that his daughter Liana was always right by his side and that there is no place for anyone else next to him because that's where Liana is supposed to be. Friends and family describe Liana as just being a very happy person. She was always smiling. She was very friendly, very social, and just absolutely beautiful. She had a very charismatic personality. And as I mentioned, she just loved spending time with her family, specifically with her father. She told her parents that she actually learned better at night, so because of that, her parents sent her to a night school. Since she would go to school at night, during the day, she would just hang out with her friends, you know, do homework, go to the gym because she was really into working out. She would spend time with her family, and then at night, she would attend her classes. Liana really loved heavy rock, and she was almost always dressed in black clothing. She always wore a lot of jewelry, you know, like a lot of accessories, like bracelets and necklaces. She would have dark nail polish on and sometimes would wear dark lipstick so she was very expressive with the way that she would dress and you know do her makeup she was honestly just a very beautiful and unique girl so fast forward to 2003 liana was 16 years old and she was currently in her second semester of high school at this point she was actually transferring to a new school which was a private school that was very prestigious in the community so she was transferring in the middle of the semester which can be kind of scary you you know, having to start in the middle of the school year, you know, being the new kid. So she was definitely nervous about transferring to this new school. However, those nerves quickly faded because at this new school, she met a 19 year old boy named Felipe Cafe who had also recently just started at this school, but he had started at the beginning of the year. So he was already kind of like familiar with the school and like with the other students. So let's talk a little bit about who Felipe was. Felipe Cafe was born on July 1st, 1984 in Sao Paulo. His mother, Lenice, was a nurse and his father was considered to be more, you know, middle class. A lot of news reports have kind of focused on how Felipe's family was very different from Liana's family. As I mentioned earlier, Liana's father was a lawyer, so they were pretty well off and lived in a very nice neighborhood. 
As for Felipe's family, you know, it wasn't really like that. They were more humble, you know, more lower middle class. Felipe had a couple of siblings and he was really close with his family. Everyone describes him as being extremely hardworking. He was very smart and because of how smart he was, he was actually able to get a scholarship to attend the private high school where he met Liana. He was also, you know, a very attractive person. He was in good shape and his family just describes him as being an extremely lovable person. So Felipe and Liana met at school either in August or September of 2003. The timeline is like a little bit blurry of when they actually met. However, according to friends and family, Felipe was instantly attracted to Liana and he jokingly asked her if she wanted to go on a date with him, you know, not really knowing what she would reply, but Liana accepted this invitation and the two of them began this new romance. Normally, Ari, Liana's father, would pick her up from school. So one day in September, Ari was waiting for Liana outside when he saw her walk out with a boy who was Felipe. Felipe walked Liana all the way to her car, said goodbye to her, and then walked away. So of course, Ari sees this interaction and he's like, what's going on there like is that your boyfriend like who is that boy and he says that liana replied saying no not yet so he wasn't her boyfriend yet however the next day when liana got back from school she confirmed to her parents that her and felipe were now officially boyfriend and girlfriend they even wore promise rings on their right hands to profess their love for each other I will say that interviews and news reports are a little bit confusing because some reporters state that Ari was not a fan of this relationship. Some articles state that he just did not like, you know, Felipe's family because they didn't have as much money as his family. You know, they were from a different, you know, neighborhood and just like a different lifestyle. Other reports state that he didn't care about that, but that he was upset about the age difference because Liana was 16 and Felipe was 19. So... I don't know, there's just like a lot of different articles and like confusing statements. However, in interviews with Ari, he says that he was happy with this relationship. You know, maybe not like jumping up and down, you know, like cheering happy, but you know, he was happy that his daughter had found like her first real love. So I don't know, it's just a little bit confusing as to how the family felt about this new relationship. What we do know is that Liana and Felipe were in love with each other. They were very excited about this new romance and they just deeply deeply cared about one another. Now, real quick, before we continue on with the case, I just want to take a quick break to thank our sponsors who help support this podcast. Airport anxiety is a real thing. Between constantly checking my pockets for my ID or forgetting the gate number, even though I just looked at my boarding pass, I am stressed. But when you travel with base, your bag has a function and the fashion to keep you calm, carefree, and looking cute. Base was created by actress Shay Mitchell to make sleek and affordable bags, luggage, and accessories designed to help you travel effortlessly while still looking fashionable. Base has been thoroughly made by a team who knows everything you would want in a perfect piece of luggage. 360 degree gliding wheels, a cushioned handle, built-in weight indicator, washable bags for your dirty clothes, and all the interior pockets you need to keep you organized. Their luggage comes in multiple sizes and colors, and for shorter trips, the Weekender bag is super functional and even has a place to store your shoes separately. And you don't even have to worry about a base bag in cargo or overhead. They are built to withstand travel and look cute at the same time. Till date, they've gotten over 30,000 five-star reviews. So whether you're packing for a quick trip or looking to breeze through the security line, base has your personal items covered. Literally after filming this video, I'm going to go pack and I'm going to pack my weekender. I'm going to pack my carry on luggage. Like I am ready for my trip tomorrow with all of my base luggage. And I'm so excited to look all cute at the airport with like my matching base bag. So I'm very excited to travel with base this holiday season. Right now, base is offering our listeners 15% off your first purchase by visiting basetravel.com slash what happened. Go to basetravel.com slash what happened for 15% off your first purchase. That's B e i s travel.com slash what happened and now let's get back to today's video on friday october 31st 2003 16 year old liana and her 19 year old boyfriend felipe decided that they wanted to have a little getaway together 
At this point, they had been dating for less than two months, and they felt like they were ready to go on a camping trip together to spend more quality time alone. I'm sure Liana figured that her parents probably wouldn't be happy about this camping trip. Like, I'm trying to put myself in her shoes at 16 years old. I just feel like my parents probably would not let me go camping alone with my boyfriend. So since she figured that her parents probably wouldn't allow this, Liana told a lie to her parents. She told them that she was going to go on a trip to Il Habela, which is a very common vacation town with a couple of her friends from her youth group. Now, she said that this was going to be just like a fun trip. She didn't mention anything about going camping. She had actually gone on these trips before with this friend group, so when she told her parents that she was going to go on another trip again, they really had no issues with this because, again, this was something that she had done many times before. Her dad would normally drive her to the bus stop that would take her to this vacation spot, so he was like, okay, sounds good. What time do you want me to take you to the bus? However, that's when Liana said that she didn't need a ride from him because her boyfriend Felipe had offered to drive her there. Ari, you know, really had no reason to doubt what his daughter was saying because she never lied to her parents and they just honestly trusted her. So Felipe giving her a ride to the bus stop didn't really like raise red flags for them and they honestly just figured that her boyfriend was just trying to, you know, make a nice gesture. As for what Felipe told his family, he told his parents that he was going to go camping with a group of friends. So he also lied to them and didn't tell them that he was going to go camping alone with his girlfriend. I'm not really sure why Felipe lied to his parents, you know, because he was a little bit older. So I feel like maybe he would have had more freedom, but maybe he also he thought that his parents wouldn't be comfortable with that idea. So that's why he lied and said that he was going to go with his friends. Felipe packed up his backpack, said goodbye to his mother and then left the house to go meet up with Liana. The couple met up and headed downtown to the Sao Paulo Art Museum and they pretty much spent the majority of the night on these benches that were underneath the museum and they just sat there waiting for the buses to start running again the next morning. They felt safe waiting on these benches even if it was like at nighttime because this area was pretty quiet and they just felt comfortable waiting there. I don't understand why they had to wait there like that part's like a little bit confusing to me why they couldn't just travel to the camping site Saturday morning so I'm not sure if it's just because they wanted to start their like getaway early and they were like you know what we'll just sit on these benches and like wait it out so they waited on these benches and at 5 a.m. on Saturday they got on the bus going to the Diete bus terminal I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong, which took an hour. And then they took a two-hour bus to their next destination in Embuguasu. They then took a van to San Rita. Now, this neighborhood where they were going to camp isn't the best. It was kind of a dangerous neighborhood. I mean, that's how I would describe it. That's how the news sources describe it. And there has been a lot of crime that has happened in this specific neighborhood. Although it wasn't the safest place to be, a lot of people would go there to go camping, to go fishing, to have cookouts with their friends and just like hang out with people. In fact, Felipe had actually been to this specific spot a couple of times. I believe he had started going to this spot when he was like 14 years old. So he was pretty familiar with this area and he would often come with like large friend groups. They would all park their cars together and just have like a big cookout. So Felipe was somewhat familiar with this area, but Liana had never been here before. In an interview that Ari did, he stated that his daughter probably would have never agreed to go camping in this area if she had known how it truly was because it's just filled with like insects and it's like very musky and it really just isn't like the most like romantic or like cleanest place to be. So he truly feels like his daughter had no idea that she was going to be going to this location. So that's just like a little background as to what this neighborhood was like. So when Liana and Felipe got off the bus and started walking around, you know, try to find their camping spot, they really stood out to the people in the neighborhood, especially Liana, because, well, first of all, she was very pretty. And then she was also wearing like, you know, her jewelry and she just was wearing all black. So it definitely just like stuck out to people. And on top of just, you know, her appearance, her and Felipe were also carrying around like big backpacks and like big luggages. So they definitely were drawing attention to themselves. Themselves. Of course, they didn't do this on purpose and like nothing that happened was their fault because of how they dressed and what they were doing. But that is just like what witnesses have stated, you know, like they saw them get off the bus and like were immediately drawn to them because of how just like out there they looked. 
So while they were walking to their camping spot, they came across two men, 16-year-old Champina and then another man named Paolo, who was also known as Pernambuco. Now, we're not really sure if they had an interaction with one another or if they just like passed each other and that was it. So I don't know if like Champina and Pernambuco spoke to Leon and Felipe. We don't really know. However, as soon as these two men saw the couple, they were immediately attracted to Liana. And they just knew that later that night, they were going to attack the couple. So Liana and Felipe pass by these two men. They continue making their way to the campsite and they eventually arrive to an abandoned farmhouse in the greater Sao Paulo area. And that's where they begin to set up their camp. Now, the reason why this house was abandoned is because the previous owner that lived there was actually shot during an attempted robbery. So he was able to escape the robbery, thankfully, and like survived. But he just never returned to his house because he was absolutely frightened of this neighborhood and of what the people in this neighborhood were capable of. So he pretty much just like abandoned the house. And now people would use that house to go camping or, you know, to just like hang out and like drink. So again, this just shows how this neighborhood really wasn't the best to be in. Liana and Felipe started setting up their camp and that's when Liana got a call from her dad. He was calling, you know, just to check in, you know, to see how the trip had gone and just to see what the girls were doing. As they were speaking, he started to get concerned because he didn't really hear any noise in the background. She was supposed to be with her friends from a youth group, so he should be hearing, you know, laughter in the background, you know, teens speaking to each other, but it was pretty silent. So he asked Liana, is everything okay? And Liana said, yes, everything's fine. She expressed that her friends were still asleep and that's why he wasn't hearing anybody talking. Her father accepted this answer because again, he really had no reason to doubt his daughter. They continued their conversation and then they hung up the phone. After this phone call, Liana and Felipe continued to set up the camp and continued to enjoy their vacation. The next day on Sunday, Ari called Liana just to check in on her once again, but this time she didn't pick up the phone. He kept calling and calling her, but all of the phone calls just kept going straight to voicemail. He was a little bit worried about this, but then he figured that maybe she just didn't have any cell service. On top of that, she was supposed to be returning home that night. So he was going to go pick her up at the bus stop in a couple of hours. So, you know, he just figured, you know, everything's fine. I'll see her later tonight. A couple of hours went by and it was now time for him to go to the bus stop and pick up his daughter. He pulls up, but Liana never gets off the bus. Not only does Liana never get off the bus, but none of her friends do. At this point, Ari is starting to get concerned because what is going on? Where is his daughter and where is this youth group? He decides to call one of Liana's friends to, you know, figure out what's going on. And the friend picks up the phone and Ari's like, hey, do you know where Liana is? The friend doesn't really know what to say. She's kind of just like playing off the question. But that's when Ari gets really serious and tells her that she needs to tell him the truth right now. That's when the friend admits to Ari that Liana actually went camping with Felipe. After hearing the shocking news, which I'm sure was incredibly shocking to Ari, I mean, at this point, he was thinking that his daughter was on a trip with her youth group, not camping alone with her boyfriend of two months. So he was definitely shocked and he just knew that something was wrong. He returned to the house, got Liana's address book, and he was able to find Felipe's home address. So he drives to Felipe's house, knocks on the door and starts speaking with Felipe's mother. And he starts asking Felipe's mother, you know, what's going on? Where is your son and where is my daughter? And, you know, of course, Felipe had told his family that he was going to go camping with his friend. So the mom was like I have no idea like I didn't know that they were together however he did tell us that he was gonna go camping in Embu Guasu so as soon as Ari heard this you know where they were gonna be he immediately drove over to Embu Guasu and at this point he wasn't thinking that the worst had happened you know he was just thinking that maybe Felipe and Liana had gotten carried away maybe they missed their bus maybe they overslept and that they were still at the camping ground so he arrived to the campsite and he started driving around but he didn't see any signs of his daughter or a Felipe anywhere. He drove back to Sao Paulo and that's when he went to the police station and reported his daughter Liana as missing. 
While the police are, you know, getting the investigation together, Ari also informs the rest of the family that Liana is missing. And that's when her 12-year-old brother says that he knew that she was going to sneak off with Felipe and that she was supposed to, you know, keep in touch with him to let him know that she was okay, but that she hadn't called him at all that Sunday. So now Liana wasn't only, you know, dodging the calls from her dad, but now she wasn't even in contact with her brother, who was the one that knew about this plan in the first place. So it's definitely starting to get suspicious you know, why is Liana not answering the phone? So the next morning at 7 a.m., Ari went back to Mbuguasu and went over to the bus station and talked to the driver who confirmed, you know, where Liana and Felipe got off. Ari went to that location, he started searching in the woods, and that's when he found their ripped up tent that had Liana's cell phone in it. He called the police and told them, you know, what he had just found, and that's when the police arrived at the scene. The police also started looking around the campsite and they eventually found Liana's wallet, her and Felipe's cell phone, and their clothes. It's so crazy to me that, you know, Ari was the one that found this and Ari was the one that was driving to all these locations and, you know, pretty much doing the work for the police. I get it, you know, it's his daughter, so I'm sure he would have moved mountains and he would have turned every rock over to look for his daughter, but it is really sad how at the beginning he didn't really have support from the police. However, now that all of these items have been found, the police really picked up their investigation and the media also picked up on the story and was reporting on it right away. A helicopter with the couple's photo were flown and over 5,000 flyers were spread all throughout the area. So everyone was looking for Liana and Felipe. Their faces were everywhere. I mean, everyone was just so scared as to what could have happened to them. The day after this, on Tuesday, a man named Arnaldo, who like worked in the area, I believe he was like a bushman, reached out to Ari and asked him if he had permission to join the search parties and to look around the trails, you know, to see what clues he could find. Now, Arnaldo Ronaldo knew the area very well because of his job and he was just really moved by the case. You know, a 16 year old girl going missing with her 19 year old boyfriend. It's definitely something that caught everyone's attention and that was really sad to hear. So Arnaldo just wanted to get involved and help in any way that he could to see if he could find any clues in regards to their whereabouts. So Ari's like, yes, of course you can help. Like, you know, this area very well, like you do what you got to do. So Arnaldo starts looking around and that's when he comes across a 50 year old man named Antonio. Now, Arnaldo just knew that Antonio was bad news. Something about this guy just stuck out to him. So he actually brought Antonio to the police station because he suspected that he knew or had something to do with the disappearance of Liana and Felipe. Antonio arrives to the police station and police are like, do you know anything about this case? Did you have anything to do with this? And that's when Antonio cracked and he told the police everything. He told them the truth about what happened to Liana and Felipe. He stated that that morning that Liana and Felipe arrived at the camp, they were walking to their campsite and came across Champina and Pernambuco, the two men that I had mentioned earlier. Well, Pernambuco found Liana to be very attractive and they could tell that the couple was going to go camping because they were carrying, you know, bags and luggage. So again, they really stood out to the people in this neighborhood because I mean, why else would you have that stuff unless you were going to go camping? Since they knew that the couple was going to be camping alone, they decided that later that Saturday night, they were going to go to their campsite and rob them. They sat out in the night with a machete and they began looking for Liana and Felipe's campsite. It wasn't really that hard to find because, I mean, these people lived in the neighborhood, so they knew the area very well. Once they found Liana and Felipe's campsite, Champina cut the tent open with the machete and they yelled for Liana and Felipe to wake up. And when they did, they saw a shotgun in their face. So not only did these two men have a machete as a weapon, they also had a shotgun. So just imagine being woken up in the middle of the night to two armed men. It's absolutely frightening. And, you know, Leon and Felipe didn't know what else to do. I mean, they didn't have anything to defend themselves with. So they listened to what the two men had to say. They made Liana and Felipe get out of the tent. And then the two men started drinking some wine that Felipe and Liana had from the night before. And while they were drinking wine, they started demanding that the couple give up their money. But Leon and Felipe didn't really have anything. You know, they were going camping. So it's not like they brought a lot of cash or like expensive items 
items with them. They really had nothing to offer. So because they didn't really have any money or like anything valuable to offer them, Champina and Pernambuco covered Liana and Felipe's heads with towels and made them walk to Antonio's house who wasn't home at the time. And this was about a two kilometer walk, which is a little bit over a mile. On this walk, Liana was trying to tell them that her parents had money and that they were willing to pay anything to make sure that they would return safely. So she was trying to tell them like, hey, I don't have any money now, but like I can get you some money. However, it truly seemed like Champina and Pernambuco didn't really care about the money. They eventually arrived to Antonio's house and this is when Liana and Felipe were put in a small room inside this house that just was really gross. Like there's photos of this house and it absolutely looks frightening. Like it literally looks like a nightmare. The house was not in very good condition. There was ripped and broken furniture everywhere. There was just like boxes piled up and just filled with junk. The house was just extremely dirty and they ended up putting Felipe in one room and then they took Liana to another room. So they separated the couple and unfortunately after separating the pair, this is when Champina and Pernabuco R-worded Liana multiple times throughout the night. Before this attack, Liana was still a virgin. Apparently Felipe could hear everything that was happening since he was just in the next room over, but he was tied up so there really wasn't anything that he could do. He was just screaming, begging the men to stop this attack and just begging them to spare their lives and just begging them to stop but the men just wouldn't listen. Apparently, Felipe actually lost his voice because he was screaming so loud and he was crying so much from listening to what happened to Liana, which is just absolutely heartbreaking to hear to think about him losing his voice because that's how much he was straining himself and fighting and you know like trying to stop this from happening and just knowing that he was tied up and that there wasn't anything he could do is is just terrible according to some reports the two men also physically assaulted felipe while he was tied up so the two men were just on this crazy attack you know jumping from one room to attack liana and then jumping to the next room to attack felipe at about 6 o'clock in the morning on Sunday, the two boys took the couple, whose hands were still tied, out of the house, and the four of them just started walking around. Then Pernambuco, who was carrying the shotgun, walked with Felipe while Champiña and Liana stayed behind. Pernambuco made Felipe get on his knees, and then he shot him in the back of the head execution style. Liana, of course, freaked out when she heard the sound of the gunshot, but Champina told her that they had freed Felipe and that he was fine. So they made her believe that they had actually released him, that they were going to release her, and that everything was going to be okay, which is just so incredibly sad, you know, having that false hope thinking, you know, oh, okay, he's free, like maybe he can go get help, or like at least he's alive, and then to just not even know that he's actually dead is horrible. The reason that Champina and Pernambuco killed Felipe is because they honestly felt like they didn't really have a need for him anymore. I mean, yes, they were beating him and like hitting him, but like what they truly wanted was Liana, which is so disturbing and just feels so wrong to say. But I mean, that's the truth. That's what they state. You know, they just wanted Liana because they could continue assaulting her. That's exactly what they did. After they killed Felipe, they went back to the house and Champiña R-worded Liana multiple times throughout the day. At this point, they state that Liana wasn't even screaming anymore. She wasn't fighting back. She just went into an emotionless state of shock. On Monday morning, the owner of the house, Antonio, finally returned home and he wasn't alone. He ended up arriving with another man named Agnaldo. Now, Agnaldo is not a good guy. He was an alcoholic that didn't have a job and he's just a terrible person. So Antonio and Agnaldo arrive to the house and they're like, what is going on? Like, who is this girl? Like, what is happening? And that's when Champina filled them in on what had happened, how they had kidnapped Liana and Felipe, how Felipe was dead. And then he offered Liana to the two men. And Agnolda accepted this offer. He proceeded to then R-word Liana. As for Antonio, he claims that he never R-worded Liana, but 
who knows if that's the truth i know it's just a lot to say it's it was so incredibly hard to you know watch the documentary on this and just listen to these details because you just think about like what liana was going through in these moments and how all these men were just assaulting her it's just so disturbing to think about it's so sad and i just don't get what's wrong with these men like how can people be so evil to commit something so gruesome so as the day continued antonio started making some coffee and some food for all the men while champiña and agnolda took turns assaulting liana again it's just shocking with this behavior i mean antonio is making coffee and food for his friends while they're literally assaulting someone like in the other room it just seems so disturbing like i don't even know how someone could even eat after committing such a horrible crime antonio claims that he never assaulted liana but yet he felt comfortable enough to make coffee and like make food while a young teenage girl is being assaulted in the next room i'm telling you there's just these men are truly evil so later on throughout the day another man ended up joining the group who's also named antonio his full name is antonio matias de barros i know there's like a lot of antonios in this case so he had stopped by to to visit his friends and that's when he ended up coming across champiña and liana once again champiña offered liana to this man and then this antonio also awarded liana it's just shocking how many people came across liana but didn't offer her any help the next day on tuesday all of the men walked with liana who wore a hoodie covering her face to another friend's house and champina introduced liana as his girlfriend so remember at this point liana's face is everywhere you know there's flyers being thrown all over the area there her face is on the news you know at this point you know people should be aware of her disappearance but apparently this friend had no idea who she was didn't see her flyer nothing and a lot of people wonder you know why didn't liana tell this friend like hey help me these men are holding me hostage well it's because liana was way too traumatized after everything that she had just endured since saturday night and again she was just in a state of shock so i'm sure she was scared because at this point she had already seen four different men who didn't save her and who added to the trauma and added to the assault so i'm sure seeing this other man just made her feel like you know what's the point of saying anything like he's probably going to do the same to me so after going to this friend's house champiña's like hey i want to go fishing so he takes liana fishing with him and she literally was just sitting next to him while he sat there and was fishing again just so casual like holding someone hostage and taking them fishing with you while champiña was fishing his brother actually ran into them like yeah his brother ran into them and was like hey where have you been since saturday night mom is worried because no one has seen you for a couple of days and who is this girl the brother also mentioned that there was a lot of police activity in the neighborhood so maybe it seems like the brother knew you know who liana was and that the police were looking for her but, you know, I guess the brother just didn't want to get involved. I'm not really sure. Champiña once again just stated that Liana was his girlfriend and his brother just believed it. So the next day on Wednesday at about 5 o'clock in the morning, Champiña took Liana to Antonio's house again, drank some coffee, and then the two of them left and Champiña brought his machete with him. Champiña had promised Liana that he was going to drop her off at the bus station so that she could go home to her family, but this was a lie. They walked through the woods for three kilometers with Liana walking slightly ahead. They ended up arriving to a stream and that's when Champiña called to Liana so that she would turn around. And when she turned around, he attacked her with the machete first cutting her on her neck in an attempt to slit her throat. She tried to get away and Champiña stabbed her 15 times in the back and in the chest. Then he hit her head with the knife, which was ultimately her cause of death. After this, he cleaned off the machete in the stream and just returned to his house. At home, he took off his blood-covered clothes, hid the machete in them, and then just went to sleep. Yeah, like just went to sleep as if he didn't just do the most horrible thing. The next morning, his brother told him that the police were looking for him. So he actually went to the police station, spoke with the police, and then he just went home. I'm not sure if police just like didn't know like what was going on or if they didn't have enough evidence against him. 
I don't know, but he was able to just go back home. After this, I'm sure he kind of, you know, felt the heat. So he ended up going to his aunt's house to hide, which was in a different town. And I'm not sure if he just hoped like this would like blow over and that they would never find him or what his game plan was. So Antonio tells police all of this because again, this is just what Antonio had confessed to the police. So he tells them all of this. And on November 10th, 2003, the police arrested all five suspects involved in the disappearance and murder of Felipe and Liana. They arrested Champiña, Pernambuco, Antonio Cataño de Silva, Agnaldo Pires, and Antonio Matias Barros. When Champiña was arrested, he confessed to everything and he literally showed no remorse. Like he wasn't like, I'm so sorry, like I don't know why this happened or, you know, I, I'll tell you exactly what happened, like please forgive me, nothing. A detective asked him, you know, why did you have to kill Liana? And also, why did you have to mutilate her? And Champiña simply replied with, because I wanted to. So who is Champiña? Like, how is this 16-year-old kid so evil? He definitely had a history of being violent and he also had a criminal record. He was actually the suspect in the murder of a homeless man in this neighborhood. So he definitely had a violent past. He dropped out of school in the fourth grade and he was working as a bricklayer's assistant at the time of the case. Antonio, one of the men that was involved, was a bricklayer. So that's how the two of them met and that's how the two of them knew each other. As for Pernambuco, the one that also abducted Felipe and Liana, he also had a record. So all of these men are just not good men. They're all just absolutely evil. And I'm so happy that Antonio like confessed to everything and just told them straight up what happened because these men like could have gotten away with it. You know, they could have ran away. They could have, I don't know, but I'm just so happy that they were caught as quickly as they were. So the same day that Champiña and the other four suspects were arrested, Champiña took the police to where Liana and Felipe's bodies were left. Now, again, Champiña, whose real name is actually Roberto, but goes by Champiña, he was 16 years old at the time that he committed this crime, so he was a minor. Because of this, he was sent to stay at a CASA facility in Sao Paulo. Now, CASA stands for Court Appointed Special Advocates, whose job is to represent and care for juvenile offenders. Because of the law in Brazil, Champiña didn't need to have a trial, but he did need to stay at this facility until he turned 21. After he turned 21, he was technically allowed to be released, but because his crimes were so horrific, after he turned 21, the public ministry requested his civil interdiction. Now, a civil interdiction is a legal restraint put on a person who is unable to manage himself or his property, often due to being mentally challenged. And Champigna did suffer from a lot of psychiatric disorders, according to an evaluation report that was done on him. He had antisocial personality disorder, and he also just had a couple of, you know, other problems. So he was seen to be as a threat to society in the future. So he, they were like, we can't release this guy. Like, he's way too dangerous to be out here, even if he is an adult now he's 21 like maybe he's changed like no people were actually scared for champiña to be released so because society was like we don't want to deal with him champiña was transferred to an experimental health unit that specializes in the recovery of young offenders with mental illnesses in july of 2006 antonio cataño de silva agnaldo pires and antonio matia barros were sentenced antonio silva that's the man who came into this all later was sentenced to 124 years of multiple physical abuse against liana as for Agnaldo, he received 47 years for physical abuse against Liana. And the reason that Antonio Silva got a longer sentence was because he admitted to R-wording Liana multiple times. As for Antonio Barros, the owner of the home, he was charged with false imprisonment, helping the accused escape, and the concealment of a weapon of crime, and he only received six years. 
Meanwhile, Pernambuco, whose real name was Paulo, as I mentioned earlier, he was the last one to be sentenced, and in November of 2007, he was finally sentenced to 110 years and 18 days in prison for homicide, kidnapping, r warding, and false imprisonment. At least three out of those four men will be in prison for pretty much the rest of their lives, but as for Antonio, I mean, he only got six years, so he's out now. I feel like he should have gotten more because, I mean, yeah, he claims that he did an R word Liana, but he was still like participating in it, you know, by not going to the police, by not reporting them, by not stopping it. I just feel like he should have gotten more than six years. As for Champigna, who honestly is the most evil out of the five men, like I truly feel like he's the one that did all of this and kind of, you know, led the pack. He still remains in the experimental health unit facility to this day, and he's about 36 years old. He actually did make an attempt to run away from the facility on May 2nd of 2007 at about 6 p.m. with another inmate, but he was actually captured just 11 hours after attempting to escape. Apparently, his own family actually informed the police about where he was, and he was readmitted to the facility. He also made several pleas to the Supreme Court where his defense argued that he should be allowed to live with a relative and, you know, undergo periodic psychological evaluation until he can return to a normal life. However, all of these requests have been denied. So this is basically like a long-term hospitalization that some people consider illegal because there is no like legal precedent of something like this happening before. I mean, they literally made this facility for Champigna which is crazy because like, again, society didn't want to deal with him. The prison reform system didn't know what to do with him either. So they're like, let's just make this facility for him and just put him in there for the rest of his life. On December 17th, 2007, the media released footage of Champigna in this facility that he had to stay in. His house was like decorated. He had like a couch. He had like a huge flat screen TV. He received five meals a day that were made by a nutritionist. And when people saw these photos, they were kind of just like, oh, like he kind of looks like he's getting like good treatment. Like he has like a flat screen and stuff. So it definitely just made people upset to see like the conditions that he was living in. And it also came out that he was costing the state like thousands of dollars a month. So keeping him in this facility, you know, feeding him, giving him what he needs was just costing a lot of money. So yeah, the public was just very upset about this. You know, his living situation just seemed better than how a lot of people lived. And the public directed their anger at the government because they were like, I mean, this guy is evil. He did something so terrible and he's living with like a flat screen TV. So of course everyone was mad and the governor, Jose Sarro, actually had to come out and address all of these comments. He said that it was better for Champigna to be stuck in a place where they can keep an eye on him than out on the streets committing other crimes crimes. Ari, Liana's father, has spoken out about this and he said that it's important to discuss what to do with Champigna. You know, do they throw away the key forever? Do they put him back into society? You know, how will society accept him? Will society even accept him? Should he stay in this health facility forever? Ari says that there's a lot to discuss and that it's important to have this discussion because What is the end goal? At what point is enough enough? So it's definitely like an interesting discussion that he brought up. I just, I don't know what the right answer is. You know, should they keep him in there forever? Should they try to give him a second chance? I personally feel like no, I don't feel like he deserves to be out because what he did is absolutely terrible. But yeah, Ari definitely thinks it's important to discuss this and discuss like rehabilitation and, you know, reformation, like what is the best treatment for Champigna? According to a criminal lawyer named Alexandre, Champigna is not serving a sentence, but a security measure. So he will be staying in this facility as long as he remains a danger to society. So maybe one day he could be free. I would definitely love to know what you guys think about this and about what Ari is talking about you know, do you throw away the key forever or do you try to give him a second chance? As for what happened to Liana's family, her father said that his marriage ended after all of this happened and that then Liana's grandfather died just three months later of lung cancer and that it was just too much for the family, which I just can't even imagine. I mean, your daughter dies in such a brutal and horrific way. Then three months later, her grandpa dies. It's just, it's too much for any family to go through. And we've discussed on this podcast before how 
this type of stuff can really affect a family and affect a marriage and it just changes everything. As much as this hurt Ari, he says that he had to continue with his life. You know, he had to be there for his son. He had to be there for his ex-wife and he had to be there for himself. In a documentary that came out about like eight years ago, Ari stated that he couldn't imagine if his daughter had survived this because then she would have to live with this trauma forever. He misses his daughter so much and he will love her forever. As for Felipe's family, his mother feels the same way as Ari, that this was so incredibly difficult and that there's just too much trauma to unpack, especially because a lot of people were blaming Felipe for what happened. They were claiming that he had kidnapped Liana, that he put her in this bad situation by taking her to this camping ground, that, you know, he shouldn't have been doing this with like a minor. There was just a lot of negative comments made towards Felipe and his family when they were first reported missing Felipe's mom says that detectives and like dogs and like all these people showed up to their house being like where's Liana like Felipe abducted her Felipe is the bad person here and that she was like wait like my son is also missing like he's innocent in this so she just says that it was all absolutely traumatizing and just to hear what people have said about her son is very hurtful it is really sad you know because Felipe also lost his life and he's also also a victim. I'm sure he didn't bring Liana there because he knew something bad was going to happen. Like he just wanted to go camping with his girlfriend. He just wanted to have a romantic getaway. You know, I'm sure he never thought that anything like this would have happened to the both of them. My thoughts and prayers go out to both families. I am just so sorry that this happened to Felipe and to Liana. They both seemed like absolutely amazing people who had very bright futures ahead of them and it's just absolutely terrible that their life was taken from them at such a young age. But all right, you guys, that is pretty much all the information I have for today's episode. Thank you guys so much for being here and for taking the time to listen to what happened to Liana Friedenbach and Felipe Cafe. If you're watching this video on YouTube, make sure to leave me a comment down below so I can see your thoughts on this case. If there's ever any other cases that you would like me to cover, also leave me a comment under my YouTube video or you guys can send me a message on Instagram. Don't forget to follow, rate, and review what happened wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to my YouTube channel true crime jackie for full video episodes you can also find me on instagram and on tiktok at true crime jackie bye guys